Oh, there it is. All right, looks like the attendees won't actually be able to join until right on the hour, so you can wait 25 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to just start it, CJ, or? I, I did start it, but the I just got a message saying. No, I meant like like doing a slight intro to the session. Oh, know. sure. I think we have. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the last day of the conference. Um, today we have Gary Schief with us and Loretta Venegas to give us a presentation on the NDP and PDS permit process. I wish I can just readily say that acronym, but I'm sure our presenters will for us. Um, yes. So Gary, feel free to take it away. Thank you, CJ. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so. I go by NIPDES sometimes instead of NPDES, so that's another way to say it. Um, so, so let me give you a little bit of background about myself. I'm uh, a senior permit writer in the NIPDES or NPDES permit section for Region 9 in San Francisco. And I'm also the uh, liaison for NPDES permitting in tribal um, areas in And, uh, you know, one of the things Hey, Loretta, did he freeze on us? I'm sorry, I had my uh, micro uh, mute. Yes, it looks like we lost um, Gary for now. If any attendees out there, if you can chat and let us know if you hear us, that'd be great. <laughs> can anyone hear us? We only hear each other. <laughs> Um, let's see, should I uh, log out and log back in? Oh, he left us, so maybe he'll try to okay. come back in in a moment. Okay. It doesn't look like anyone can hear us then. Oh, thank you, Liana. <laughs> thank you, Rob. Well, thank you everyone for your patience. Yes, thank we're trying you, to get we're trying to get Gary back. Yes, thank you, everyone. Loretta, can you message him on Teams or anything just to see where sure. what's going on? Yeah, he said he's trying to rejoin to the link. Hello, can you hear me oh. now? Yes, Gary, thank Welcome you. Welcome back, Gary. <laughs> Welcome back. Technical difficulties. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, no, sorry, I will everyone. start sharing again. Okay, so as I, as I was saying, I hear an echo now. Can you? Can you yeah, we're hearing a bit of an echo. Hmm. Don't know what I'm doing wrong. Oh, I think it's kind of fading away. So just think you can okay. continue. 
All right. Uh, as I was saying, I wanted to sort of get a sense of who all is attending today. So if you don't mind, if you could just type in your name and who you're with in our chat, that would be great. I also have a, a quick poll question for folks so that I can, you know, kind of target my talk a little bit. And the poll question is, um, uh, I'll just include that right now. Let's see. It, it basically is asking if you, what's your experience with NPDES permitting? So let me launch that. Do you, do, do folks see the, the poll question there? You can answer in the chat if you like. I see it. Thank you, Eddie. I see your response. And there are two options, right? Draft or review or certify, right? Yeah, I, I wanted to have three, but I guess they only allowed two for some reason. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to let review and certify be a, um, a combined response. Just take a couple of minutes for that. Um, so, you know, what, I guess one of the questions folks would, would have is, you know, how, why is NPDES permits, the permit process important to, um, uh, tribal regulators and, um, especially since, you know, at this point, uh, the, there's no tribe in the nation that has been delegated, uh, the authority to issue NPDES permits. But I think the the answer is that in some cases they help us draft the permits like the Navajo Nation does. And also you definitely need to be able to review them and in some cases certify them under the 401 cert authority um, when they are occurring when the NPDES facility is on your tribal uh, land. So I wanted to just get a sense of you know where, where people are with or experience with this. I think, uh, I, let me see if I can now uh, close the poll. So see what response I get. This should be automatic, let's see. So I see like a couple of people or one person has drafted some. Most people are either reviewing or certifying. So that's kind of what I expected. And I will make sure that I emphasize that more. So Loretta, do you want to go to the, the next slide? So let's start with, you know, not even an NPDES permit, but just a permit. What is a permit? It's a license to do something and it's issued by the government. Uh, it's granting permission to do something that would be illegal in the absence of a permit. Uh, you could drive, but if you didn't have a license, it would be illegal for you to drive. Uh, similarly, um, an NPDES permit is a permit to uh, discharge treated effluent into a receiving water. Uh, you could do that without a permit, but doing so would uh, expose you to liability. So an NPDES permit is basically a license to discharge, and it's not a, a right to discharge. Um, and it's, next slide please. Uh, the NPDES permits are um, authorized under Section 402 of the Clean Water Act. And who needs an NPDES permit? And it's basically all point sources uh, that are discharging a pollutant uh, in effluent into a waters of the US. Uh, next slide. So what is a point source? Um, Point source is basically a discharge through a discrete conveyance into the waters of the US. Some examples would include industrial facilities, um, sometimes they're mines, also sewage treatment plants, sewage treatment lagoons, and also stormwater from industrial sites and storm sewers. Uh, non point sources are not regulated under uh, NPDES permits, 
and those include discharge from land runoff from ag activities um, and also from private land. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then the second part of the definition is, you know, it's a pollutant that's being discharged. There's um, quite a few different uh, categories of these. Um, there's the conventional ones that we all know about, total suspended solids, pH, oil and grease, uh, toxics, um, 126 party pollutants, which are listed in the CFRs. I don't have the particular section here, but um, they're not in the 40 CFR section of the of the code. Uh, there's also non-conventional pollutants such as ammonia, chlorine, uh, toxicity as a general category that includes um, whole effluent toxicity. So it's not a specific pollutant that is being monitored, but rather the discharge as a whole and whether it's toxic to um, either fish or to human health in the receiving water. So, and then other examples are temperature and nutrients, as well as trash. Um, these are all different pollutants that could be restricted or controlled by limits in a typical NPDES permit. Next slide. And the, the final leg of the three part definition into a waters of the US. Um, which might also, and is usually is a water of the, waters of the tribe, if they're located in uh, on a tribal uh, reservation or an Indian country. So um, the definition of waters of the U.S., as you all probably know, has been moving around and been in flux. Under the previous administration, a rule was passed known as the Navigable Waters Protection Rule, which uh, tried to uh, define it more narrowly compared to like what the definition was under previous um, rules as well as under uh, Supreme Court decisions. But that rule has now been um, vacated. Uh, and so therefore, it's back to sort of a definition that's more broad and not as restrictive as it was before. Um, and. This, this slide was developed using sort of the previous definition. So all waters currently used, used in the past or susceptible to use for interstate commerce, including all waters that are subject to the ebb and flow of the tide. This is more for like um, uh, coastal waters and includes rivers, lakes, streams, tributaries, territorial seas, wetlands, and ephemeral washes. So next slide. And so those are the uh, types of facilities that need NPDES permits. And um, there are two major categories of permits. One are individual permits for individual facilities. And they usually have like a permittee applying for it, um, a particular facility. And then there are general permits which are issued in a broad, for a broad category, such as for, um, construction activities, or in the case of um, the Navajo Nation, there's one for what's known as low threat uh, discharges. So basically very small discharges of relatively clean uh, water that are uh, covered under that general permit. And uh, they, people don't need specific um, applications for that. They just submit a notice of intent to be covered under the permit. and EPA does a review, a much quicker review than for a permit application, uh, and then issues a letter authorizing coverage under the general permit. So that's basically issuance of general, I mean, uh, developing and issuing general uh, permits, NPDES permits in general. Um, any questions at this point? I'm going to move after this into more of what I think is of interest to the group, which is the, the review and certification of permits. Okay. Um, can we go to the next slide, Rada? 
Um, well, I, I think we might want to skip some of these because uh, th this is not really the focus that I want to have for this talk. So let's go to the next one. Yeah, that one too. Sorry. And so let's keep going. Sorry, <laughs> jump over. So yeah, so now this comes into the previous slide, please. And one, one more previous, I'm sorry. So, you know, one of the things that um, will be included uh, in a review package that you might receive for both reviewing the permit and considering whether to certify it is a draft of the permit. And the permit itself would not only include, um, you know, the conditions for uh, pollutants to be, uh, which pollutants and what levels of pollutants are allowed, so the permit limits in the permit, but there would also be a map of the facility showing an intake and discharge location, uh, as well as sort of a process diagram that shows what's going on with the facility in terms of the treatment at the facility. So next diagram, next slide. Uh, it could be a pretty simple um, flow diagram. You know, it shows what what's going on with the uh, facility uh, and where it's going to uh, discharge. So that all can be reviewed uh, in the draft permit. And that's what, you know, you would be looking at. Uh, one of the first questions I guess you would ask in terms of reviewing an, uh, an NPDES permit that came before you would be, um, what are the standards of, or what are the limits in the permit based on? Which, which um, water quality standards are being used? So, um, you know, for tribal areas that have their own or tribes that have their own water quality standards, usually it, would, it will be the water quality standards that have been adopted by the nation or the tribe and uh, EPA uses that to draft the permit. As I said earlier, um, you know, as of this time, uh, no tribes in the, in the U.S. have been delegated authority to issue NPDES permits, though actually in Region 9, we've received uh, some interest in an application, in fact, in the past from the Navajo Nation, but that was not um, done. It, it, it wasn't uh, completed and accepted, so they still do not have the um, authority to issue those permits, but uh, they, they help us draft uh, a lot of these permits and develop their uh, capacity to write permits in the future uh, by helping EPA draft such permits. Um, there's also uh, some interest from a smaller tribe, I think, in our region. The Dry Creek Band of Homa Indians has, has expressed interest and also um, seeking NPDS uh, permitting authority. I'm wondering if any other folks on this session know of whether their their um, tribes are considering this, and if so, you know, you know let us let us know if if that's the case. Um, anyway, so uh, next slide. So when um, EPA actually looks at the application and then works to draft the permit, it will um, issue or um, public notice a draft of that permit um, to go through a 30-day public notice period. And this is where, um, you know, a tribe might also uh, take have an opportunity to review the permit more generally and also look at it from a 401 cert uh, certifying authority standpoint as well. Though actually for the 401 certification process, it might occur before it's even public noticed uh, in some instances. Um, when a permit is public noticed, it is, um, it's on our website usually these days. We used to do it in, uh, in local newspapers and other publications but now uh, everything has gone more electronic. So usually permits are, are public noticed on the regional or the national EPA website. Um, though if there are like 
if, if a permittee is or a permit is for a facility that is a pretty large facility or somewhat controversial facility, we might still public notice it in a newspaper um, or other publication in, in the area. Uh, and then EPA uh, looks at the responses to all any comments that are received. One of the other things that folks can often do is uh, request a public hearing if there's a lot of interest uh, in the permit. And um, in, that in, in that case, uh, EPA will, uh, in most cases, have a public hearing on the permit. And that adds a few more um, weeks to the, the, the review or the public notice period, a minimum of uh, 30 days, but as long as maybe 45 to 60 days if it's a, a, a controversial permit. Uh, once all the comments are received, then um, EPA will go, on, go ahead and respond to that and issue the final permit. Uh, this is also an opportunity for tribes to comment more generally on the permit, but also if uh, they find that there's things in the permit that um, don't meet, uh, you know, water quality standards for the tribe or are somehow not as protective of the tribal waters as they would like, there's an opportunity to um, issue a 401 certification uh, to for the permit and include conditions in that 401 certification. So uh, under the 401 certification rules, which were passed, again, a, a regulation was passed fairly recently in 2020. Um, the tribes have to, uh, uh, you know, in their in their conditions, explain or delineate a rationale for for those conditions, as well as um, cite either federal, state, downstream state, or tribal um, authority laws, regulations uh, as to why those additional conditions might be required. Um, in the case of th these are usually for individual permits. In the case of general permits. Um, the 401 certification occurs during the issuance of the general permit. So it's not a case by case basis for any person submitting an NOI under the, uh, the, the general permit. So, you know, if you're a tribe and you see a general permit is going to be issued by EPA, it might be a, a great time to really carefully review that general permit and make sure that all your concerns about whether or not anybody who might want coverage under that general permit is, uh, you know, will, will get, will only get coverage that is uh, when it's fully protective of the uh, water quality uh, on your tribal lands. I'll again, once again, pause here for any questions. I encourage people to ask questions. That way I think it's more useful to you. So I'll, I'll just wait for a few minutes here or a few seconds, see if anybody has any questions. CJ, are you, are you monitoring the chat? for those questions. I'm not hearing anybody. I hope I'm not talking into the void. <laughs> Jared, uh, no questions as of yet. Okay, no worries. Um, all righty, let's let's go to the next slide. So, you know, when you're reviewing the permit, you'll see like these are some of the major components of a permit. If any of these are missing, then obviously there might be some issues with the permit, and you might want to consider, you know, letting EPA or whoever 
is sharing the draft permit with you. And the, it might, you know, this is usually, it's always EPA in the case of NPDES permits, but for other kinds of permits, it might be the Army Corps of Engineers or whoever. But for NPDES permits, these are the major uh, components. There's a cover page that identifies the facility and has a, a lat long location of where the discharge is occurring. Make sure that it is, you know, the correct location on your uh, tribal uh, lands. Also, there are effluent limitations, permit limitations in the permit. Those should be reviewed carefully to make sure that they meet uh, tribal water quality standards if that's the water quality standards that are being used to draft the permit. Um, there's also a component that requires monitoring and that can also be reviewed to make sure that it's sufficient. So, you know, if you think that there might, it might make sense to have more frequent monitoring instead of a quarterly, you, you, for some parameter, it might be better to do weekly monitoring or bi-weekly monitoring instead of quarterly or monthly. That might be a comment that you might want to submit to uh, EPA or maybe even include as a condition in the in the uh, 401 CERT if you if you think that that's um, useful and is based on you know your own tribal uh, regulations or laws. Um, there might be also special conditions that are included in the permit. These might include things like a stormwater prevention plan or BMPs or best management practices for certain types of facilities, um, as well as um, more standard boilerplate conditions, which cover a lot of the administrative requirements of a NPDES permit. So yeah, you should make sure that you review the entire permit and make sure that it uh, meets all these uh, basic requirements. Next slide. So in some cases, there might be monitoring requirements in the per permit or parameters, not necessarily permit limits. And that's those are often included to gather data to characterize the effluent. So if, if there is um, not sufficient data when the permittee first comes in for an application or for a permit in their application, then, uh, and there's no, you know, like in, in the case of a POTW, it's always pretty obvious that there's going to be issues with um, uh, TSS and, and maybe the nutrients and stuff like that. So those would be something that would automatically be included as being potentially uh, present in the effluent. But there might be some questions about other things like metals or other toxic pollutants, which, which a monitoring uh, requirement might confirm that they exist in the discharge or also confirm that they don't exist in the discharge. So that's one of the things that you might look for when you're looking at an NPDES permit. Are there monitoring requirements that are sufficient, that you feel are sufficient to uh, make sure that the effluent is not going to impact negatively uh, the tribal waters into which uh, it's been discharged. Um, and if, if the monitoring does show that there's a potential for either an exceedance of a water quality standard in the receiving water or, you know, what's known as reasonable potential to exceed that, then um, uh, EPA can go in and put in additional limits in the future or while what's known as a reopener clause, which is a standard in every permit that is uh, written by EPA. That's part of those standard conditions, actually. So you should also check to see if those are included in um, the permits that you review. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so these are some of the standard conditions that um, you will probably find um, in sort of more boilerplate-ish language at the end of the permit. It includes a duty to comply with all the requirements and limits in the permit a duty to reapply if you know the facility is intending to continue operations after the permit term. I didn't mention earlier, and I think most of you probably already know this, but 
uh, NPDES permits are issued for a five-year term. And so uh, every five years, they need to be uh, reissued and the permittee needs to reapply for uh, continuing coverage. Um, additionally, uh, standard conditions might uh, include like a duty to mitigate if there's any sort of exceedance uh, need to halt or reduce activity is not a defense. That's one of the standard terms in a permit. So just because um, you're not doing what you're supposed to be or to the same level that, uh, the, that the permittee is supposed to be doing does not mean that they are allowed to have uh, any sort of exceedances of their limits. Uh, proper operation and maintenance is also a standard condition and permit, so you should check for that. Um, duty to provide information, that's interesting because oftentimes um, during the permit term, EPA might come back or even a tribe through EPA might ask for additional information about what's going on at the facility. And there is a standard condition in most permits that uh, imposes a duty on the applicant or the permittee to provide that information. Also, um, inspections and entry into the facility ha has to be authorized in the permit, as usually authorized in the permit. And in some cases, um, tribal entities have been delegated or at least deputed to provide that uh, inspection, um, inspection uh, inspections, sorry, to, um, in, in, instead of EPA in some cases. Like again, in the case of the Navajo Nation, they have been uh, issued um, letters that allow um, and credentials that allow them to have um, inspectors visit uh, these facilities um, on behalf of EPA, basically. Um, and that's part of their standard conditions. Should look for that in the permit. Uh, monitoring and record keeping, that is a cre important critical part of um, permits. And you should see that that's included in basically the standard, not just in the standard conditions, but also in the main text of the permit that they have that. Also signatory requirements about who signs things off, including data monitoring reports, DMRs, uh, and so forth. Next, next slide. And again, as I mentioned, there might be some special conditions to supplement the numeric effluent limits and require the permittee to undertake activities designed to reduce the potential for discharge of pollutants, uh, best management practices, uh, compliance schedules. That's an interesting one. So in some cases, um, a, a permittee may not be able to meet the permit limits right away. And under some um, either federal or even tribal water quality standards, they're permitted to have a compliance schedule, which allows them to come into compliance with uh, meeting that permit limit. And um, that's something that, you know, when you're reviewing a permit, you should pay spe special attention to because those compliance schedules should be as short as possible to get, come into compliance. Um, in the case of uh, what, what are known as POTWs, publicly owned treatment works, standard you know, uh, secondary treatment facilities, sewage treatment plants, um, they generate biosolids. And so there are requirements in the permit that explain how, that, how those need to be handled or disposed. And you should also look at that in the permit when you're reviewing it. Hey, Gary, we have a few questions. OK, great. Um, one is, I am just learning about the MPEDS. Is this permanent, per, is this permanent, permanent, or does it need renewed after a period of time? Yeah, I think I mentioned that. And again, I'll mention it again. So no, they're not permanent. They're five-year permits. The term is five years from issuance. So you know, if, if a an industrial facility, or let's even say like a, a casino is being built in, in your, um, on your land and they have a wastewater treatment plant, they need to discharge the water from that 
um, they apply for a permit, an NPDES permit. Uh, it's issued for a five-year term. After five years, they have to reapply. And during that reapplication process, they have to submit another renewal application, which is similar to the application that they submitted you know, initially when they first began operating the facility, but includes more data, probably like, you know, what if there's monitoring data they, and not limits, permit limits, that would be included. Also, during the permit term, the permittee usually is required to report what is known as uh, discharge monitoring reports, which kind of reports about what is being discharged and monitored from that facility. In the past, those used to be sort of paper documents that were sent in, but these days they're electronic. And so the facility sends in uh, those electronically to EPA and they go up in a database that we maintain and also um, go into a database that has um, been uh, available to the public. It's called ECHO, E-C-H-O, um, which if you Google that, you know, you say ECHO water quality permits, you'll see the website. And so any facility, including those on tribal lands that have NPDES permits, you should be able to see what kind of, um, you know, uh, water quality they've been, dis they been discharging over their permit term. And if there have been any violations of any of the permit limits. Thanks. And there was one more. I don't know if you're to answer this, but is this permit only required if discharging into a water body? Uh, it's only required for discharging into a surface water that is also considered or regarded as a waters of the United States. It might also be considered, you know, most of those are also when they're discharging on tribal land, also considered waters of the tribe. So our waters of the nation, they, that's, those are overlapping, but they, at the minimum, they have to be waters of the US for NPDES permitting. Uh, in some instances, I've known, like, you know, there are some waters that are only considered waters of the tribe and some tribal um, nations and entities, uh, regulatory entities have actually um, the authority to issue a different kind of permit for those discharges. I know that um, the Navajo Nation, for instance, does have um, some permits that are for just discharge to uh, waters of the Navajo Nation. These may not be waters of the U.S. And if you go back, you know, I don't, I don't want to. We don't need to go back to that slide, but want to think about what is, um, you know, what what may not be a waters of the U.S. It's like if somebody were to create a man-made lake. Um, in an upland area that's not in a water body, then that would be not considered a waters of the U.S. and may not require this this kind of permit. Of course, discharge to groundwater um, would require a different kind of permit and not an NPDES permit and require an aquifer protection permit. Yeah, thank you. That's it for now. Great. Um, yeah, I hope this has been helpful to folks who are both reviewing and certifying permits. Um, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so actually, before I conclude, let me let me just wrap up a little bit. So these are the responsibilities of the uh, permittee. So they, as I said, they submit these discharge monitoring reports. Now they're online, so they submitted net DMR reports. Um, they also have to keep up with their other permit required reports special reports that we talked about. Uh, if there are any facility inspections, uh, those need to be um, also submitted. Proper O&M should be done. Uh, regular maintenance and routine maintenance should be uh, kept up. And as I said earlier, there's a duty to reapply timely. In this case, uh, timely is 180 days before the five-year expiration date of the permit. So. If your permit is expiring, you know, in June, you should supply. Uh, you should apply for reapplication in January, or um, uh, if you're gonna, if if they're gonna plan to continue um, operating that facility. Next slide. 
So I also included a few useful um, URLs or links that people might find useful if they're reviewing permits. One of the most useful ones is like the permit writers manual, which is what EPA permit writers use. It's our uh, basic guide for writing NPDES permits. It's fairly comprehensive, has a lot of details about different aspects. And so, and it's available online at this uh, link. Also another uh, good resource is just our NPDES permits page in Region 9. Um, EPA in Region 9 uh, issues or has issued about 40 or so permits on tribal lands in, in uh, Region 9. Uh, I think about 20 or so of them, 20, 22 are in Navajo. The rest are in different tribes, including tribal areas, including uh, Hopi, White Mountain Apache, and a lot of California individual uh, permits for like casinos and other facilities in smaller uh, reservations. So if you want to see what some of these permits look like uh, and what the fact sheets to, they, to them look like, and even in some cases what the 401 certification uh, letters uh, that the tribes that have water quality standards have issued for these permits, this is a good link to go and look at that. And it's um, available on our website. And then finally, there's uh, this Tribal Water Quality Standards page, our webpage, um, which is maintained by EPA headquarters. And it's a treasure trove really of a lot of things regarding um, water quality standards, as well as permits in tribal areas. And you can find a lot of stuff there, including you know, all the water quality standards that have been approved by EPA for uh, tribes across the nation. So I think, I'm not sure what the latest number is, but it's probably around 60 or so. Um, so that might be a good place to also check out if you're interested in seeing, you know, what kind of um, water quality standards have some of the other tribes um, adopted for protecting their waters. Next slide. Yep, and as I said, you know, I'm Gary Sheff. I'm in the NPDES permit section. That's my email. If you have any questions regarding, you know, both um, review or even certification of NPDES permits that come before you, feel free to contact me either by phone or at the email. And um, uh, yeah, just just feel free to contact me. I'm I'm the liaison for uh, NPDES permitting in, in our in Region Nine, so. I'll be happy to either answer your questions or uh, direct you to people who might be able to better answer your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the great presentation. Um, we have about eight minutes left. There are any last questions, feel free to drop, drop, drop them in the chat. But if not, we can end early for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody's getting a bit hungry. Yeah. yeah. You know, day three of the conference. Yeah. No worries. I hope it's been useful. And yeah, feel free to get in touch if you need to. Thank you. Oh, we do have one question. Are oh, there please. exemptions? Exemptions. Um, well, things like um, surface water uh, discharge from agricultural activities are exempt from NPDES permits. This is just under the Clean Water Act. So it's, you know, Congress made that exemption. I guess farmers are a pretty powerful lobby. So, but anyway, um, those th that's an exemption. Um, there are a few other exemptions, but if, generally if there's any discharge of um, pollutants uh, from a point source, again, it's a point source, so like a, a pipe or a canal, or conveyance into a receiving water that's a surface water, then an NPDES permit is required. Well, I hope that answers your question, Lori. Um, anything else out there? I'm gonna give it a five, four, <laughs> three, two, one, well, thank you everyone for participating. Thank you, Gary and Loretta. Um, feel free to reach out 
to them both if any questions arise. Um, but yeah, I hope everyone has a great lunch and thanks again. Thank you. Bye now.